Praise the Lord. Shall we turn to Nehemiah chapter 3, 1 to 7? Nehemiah was stirred up by the Spirit of God to take action when he heard that the city of Jerusalem was in ruins. And it was all burned, and there was no building happening there. God's time had come for God's people to rise up and be restored. It was God's program, God's time. But God was looking for people who would desire that, who would step forward and say, Lord, I want to be part of the restoration. I want you to restore me, my family, my nation, Lord. We want to get back to your purposes. There was a deviation. There was a deviation. There was a detour. There was not in God's perfect will at all. For 70 years, they were under captivity in Babylon, and then Babylon was conquered by Persia. And now the time had come for the people to go back and build. Already, people have gone back. The 70 years that God prophesied, God commanded for the captivity, for all the sins they committed, the violation of the Sabbath, and so on. We look at our lives and we think, how much time has elapsed since we first came to know the Lord? And how much progress have we made? How much in step have we been with the Lord? Now there's a time for us to take stock and inventory and really look at it. You notice Nehemiah was a man of prayer. He was a man who feared God. You see that right there in the book. Nehemiah loved God. Though he had a position, a very good position there, in that Persian kingdom as the cupbearer, his heart was in Jerusalem. His heart was with God. We may be working. We may go to work this morning or come home from work, working nights, whatever it is, whatever position. We may, we may have a house. We may have an apartment. We may have fields. We may have a car. We may have so many things that we think of as part of us. We have an identification with them. How many people, they look at what car you drive and they instantly identify the person with the car, the vehicle. They identify the person with the house, with the clothing, with the image, with everything, including makeup, both men and women, whatever it is that they may do. You see, the image and the earthly possession and the position does not constitute who we really are. They don't. When God blesses us, we're thankful, and we praise God for it, and we enjoy the blessing, and we share the blessing. All that is good. But we must understand, they do not identify or mark who we are. The real person is within. The true person is inside the shell of the body. The true person is housed in the body, which is the spirit within, the soul. That person within the Amaya was continually concerned about the living God. That's the kind of people God wants us to be. Not wrapped up in the things around us, except to say, Lord, may your kingdom come. But to be continually worshiping and loving and serving God, communicating with God. The reason Nehemiah in chapter 1, those who are familiar with the story, the reason he was a man of prayer when he approached the king asking God's favor, even before he spoke and answered the king, requesting the favor of the king, he sought the favor of God. Hallelujah. He was a man of prayer who was seeking the favor of the living God. When we pray to God continually for everything, 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 little or big, there's a pattern. Again, this word comes up for the third time predisposition, being predisposed. That is, I have a life habit. There's a habit formed in my life through a conscious decision that I will pray to the Lord for each and every thing. That relationship with God will enable somebody to step forward and fulfill 
the purpose of God in your life and in my life. If that's not there, there will be no faith, there will be no self-discipline, we will not accomplish anything in the kingdom of God. But God wants us to be restored. He wants us to be strengthened. He wants us to be encouraged this morning that we will get on with God's program for our lives. See, the building of the walls, the rebuilding of the walls, have everything to do with what rules your spirit and my spirit. We're going to get to that in a moment. Nehemiah approached the king, Attic Xerxes, and he says, oh, the reason I'm sad when the king noticed that he was sad, not because he was sick in chapter 1 of Nehemiah, but because he had a deep burden he was carrying, and it showed in his face. He couldn't hide it. It was such a deep burden that he could not hide it. He wasn't trying to wear his face or his emotions on his cuff or sleeve, as they say. He wasn't going there to show something. He was genuinely burdened so much he couldn't contain it. God moved the king to ask the question, and he didn't kill him, being sad in the king's uh, presence. But the king had favor toward the cupbearer. And when Nehemiah prayed, that instant before he spoke and replied to the king, why are you sad? He prayed and he said, how can I be happy? The graves of my fathers, where that city is, Jerusalem, my all whole inheritance, my heritage. How can I be happy when it's all broken down? It's all burnt. The walls are broken down. Everything is a mess. Oh, the city of my fathers. And the king said, what do you want? And there began the journey to rebuilding those walls. The Lord did it in an instant. He gave favor. And there was restoration. The process was started right there. But do you know what? None of that would have happened if Nehemiah didn't recognize how bad the situation was. Think about your life. When did you take action? For anything in your life that had to do with something significant. I'm not talking about a simple grabbing a cup of coffee or walking the dog or doing the homework or brushing the teeth, getting the car to drive to work. There are things far more significant than those. When we recognize that there's a crisis, that's when we take real action. Nehemiah recognized there's a tremendous crisis. Nobody is stepping forward to perform the will of God. And so the city is in ruin. It's not just any city. This is the city of God. God told Solomon and all the Israelites, this city is my city. In fact, the eternal city where you and I will live forever and ever with God is called the New Jerusalem. Same name of the city. It's so significant. We recognize that God's work in our lives, what he began in Christ Jesus, must continue on schedule to fulfill God's purpose so that you and I can please God and play our part in the church of God. But how many of us have weak hands and lame feet? How many of us even bother to care? Lord, I'm not doing my part. I'm not doing my part in your kingdom. You have a great purpose, you said. Lord, I don't even know what it is. The greater tragedy is not that we don't know. The ignorance is not the greatest tragedy. The willingness not to know. The decision that I don't care to know. That is the greatest tragedy. So Nehemiah was moved to tears. He mourned. He fasted. He wept. Why? Why? When nobody else did. So, at least it's not recorded. Because his heart was feeling what God was feeling. Oh, that you and I would feel what God feels about your life and my life. How he feels about what you do every day, what I do every day, towards the kingdom of God. How 
how he feels about our families. Are we playing the part? Are we leading our families back to God? You see, years passed by when the entire place was devastated, desolated. We look at our lives. How many years have passed since we knew the Lord? What progress have we made? Should we not cry? Those of us who have not walked with the Lord truly? Once again, we ought to know. When somebody says, I have known the Lord for so many years. Oh, I have been walking with God for so many years. The only proof of that is, if a person has mastery over their own spirit, if there's a godly self-control where their time, their talent, and their treasure are all aligned perfectly with the will of God. If that's not the case, we have not been walking with God. It's when everything in our power that God has given us is 100% devoted to the will of God, to fulfilling his purpose. That's what God sees as walking with God. Now, how many of us can lament and mourn and say, oh, Lord, I've been walking with you. Lord, there's been such a waste, waste of all that you've given me. I've gone into the far country, into the land of sin, some of us may say. And those of us who may say, you know, I haven't gone to the streets and I haven't constituted my body and the time and the treasure God has given me, but have we made progress? Have we built what God has wanted us to build? That too is something to cry over and weep over. See, unless you and I have a deep burden, and we're not nonchalant and take it as a trivial matter, unless we're really burdened, God, what did I do with the breath you put in my lungs? When I should have been living for you, truly living for you, every ounce of my energy, Lord, it belongs to you. Now I realize it. But Lord, what should I do for all the years when I have wasted it? You see, brothers and sisters, the degree to which we mourn genuinely in the presence of Almighty God and say, God, it's too much for me. How I have wasted everything given. I have not stepped up and gone around talking about you to everybody. I have not gone around praying for people to come to you. First and foremost, my family. But Lord, I haven't been right myself. How could I ever bring my family to you? We look back, not to relive the past, but to rededicate our lives with a great fervor, with a vengeance, and say, no more. No more, not on my watch, will I take the things of God lightly. But I'm going to rebuild the walls of my spiritual life, the walls of the spiritual life of my family by taking prayer seriously as if it's life and death, because it is. I'm going to rise early and pray with all my heart for myself first. Oh, my Father, may I never depart from the living God. Lord, I want to love you and worship you and adore you early in the morning, hallelujah, and throughout the day. Lord, I want to intercede. Who will pray for my family if I don't? Brother or sister, can you answer that question? I've asked that question. God put it to me more than once in, in the past. Who is going to pray for your family if not you? Will anyone care as much as you should and that you would now that you know God, you're restored to God for your family? Who cares if they perish? More than you, more than me. Shall I take the names of my family members? Oh, God. Wake them up, Jesus. Their lives are in ruin. They're worried about making money. They're worried about what school their kids will go to. They're more concerned about this life than the next life and the true life, the spiritual life. God, wake them up. Thank you, God, you're waking me up. Lord, wake them up before they perish. That's the kind of heart that moved Nehemiah to fast and weep and mourn. That's the only reason that God gave him favor. We must know this. Favor is not for anybody and everyone who just goes to God, oh, God, give me favor, and then sing about it. 
and get more people to sing with you as if God is moved by numbers. God is not moved by numbers. He's moved by genuine tears of repentance in the heart. You know what Nehemiah did? He called out to the Lord and said, Lord, we and our fathers have corrupted our ways. That's what that righteous man said. Who is bold enough and honest enough to say to God this morning? And in your prayer closet, oh God, I and my family have corrupted your way. Lord, we have defiled your presence. No wonder we're in ruins, Lord, my family. Oh God, I want to begin interceding like never before. That I would be a godly example. I won't sit on the fence when it comes to the things of God. I won't present a lukewarm picture, a wishy-washy nature. I won't give in and cave in to the emotions of my family who don't know you when they want to drag me away from the presence of God. No. I will lovingly but firmly tell them, no. God is first. You should make him first too in your life. Can't you see that if you return to the Lord, oh, he loves you. I have heard the voice of Jesus lately that he loves me so. And he's restoring my life. Oh, family. Oh, daughter. Oh, son. Oh, brother. Oh, sister. God loves you. God loves you. Oh, dad. Oh, mom. God loves you. He wants to restore you. The reason things aren't working out, and I can guarantee it'll never work out, is because you haven't put God first. You're in mortal danger, eternal danger. But you see, God wants to rebuild. He wants to restore. We must understand both sides of the issue. It does no good to present one side of the picture. We must say, Lord, help my family to see. Help me to present the case from your word that there needs to be a real inventory. You know what happened in Nehemiah? Not only did he take action when he heard what the case was in Jerusalem. When the king graciously, by God's divine favor, gave him what he needed to go back, you know what he did? He silently went and surveyed the city gates. He went there and he took stock in the nighttime. His eyes beheld, like Jesus years later, the Son of God who went into the temple and looked around. What's going on? What's going on? How they've desecrated the temple of Almighty God. He did a survey. And he prayed some more. You see, unless we stop, stop running around, sit alone with God, give time to take an inventory, a real inventory, Lord, how many years have I wasted personally, Lord? Never again, my God. Never again. Every breath is yours. I'm going to build. Hallelujah. I'm going to rebuild by the grace of God my prayer life. Glory be to God. My reading of the word of God, the living word of God. I'm going to put myself to task to read with joy and fervency. Devour the book because my life depends upon it. My eternal life more than anything else. I'm going to rebuild my spiritual life. I don't want my soul to be like a city with broken walls, open to attack from the enemy. I don't want to languish and pine away when God wants to raise me up to be a mighty warrior in his kingdom. Yes, young and old, male and female, mother, Daughter, son, father, uncle, grandparent, aunt, cousin, brother, sister, whoever you are. God has work for you to do. To build up the walls of your own soul first. Then he will strengthen your arms to build up the church of God. Hallelujah. He will strengthen your soul to be an intercessor that will make a difference. Not simply mouthing prayers. And having some emotion with no result. 
God wants you to be a world changer. But before he can make you a world changer, he wants to make you a family changer. Before he can make you a family changer, he wants to make you a soul changer for your own soul. God's word is there. The Holy Ghost is there. God's love is there. What's left? My understanding must be on par with God's revelation. Unless that's the case, I will never take action. And I certainly won't take action the way God wants me to. Nehemiah mourned and wept and fasted. And he prayed. But you know he had hope. He didn't cry and weep and mourn. Oh God, all these years, Lord, what's wrong with my people? Forgive me, Lord. Forgive us, Lord. But he had hope. He had faith. God gives us hope and faith this morning. Will you take it? Will you take it and say, Lord, you have called me to rebuild my own spiritual life. I'm going to get to it right away. Hallelujah. It's more important than your job. It's more important than your education. It's more important than any hobby, any award in this life, any amount of money, any relationship. Your relationship with God. What are you doing? Strengthen that. That's God's question. The rebuilding of those walls had a spiritual significance. See, God's presence was there. How much do, I not, do you and I value God's presence? Do you really want to talk with him? Do you really love him? Would you talk with him in the middle of the night? Are you available for God to wake you up in the middle of your sleep? To be an intercessor? To cry out to God for some soul somewhere and not be concerned with how many hours of sleep I got? What I have to do today on the job and for this and that and the other thing, you must realize, we must realize this morning, we are spiritual people first and foremost. Our citizenship is in heaven. We have to be about our father's business. Otherwise, why would we call him father? What kind of son is it? It's a prodigal son that doesn't care about the father or the father's business. You and I must repent if we have to and say, oh, daddy, I haven't loved you at all like I should. I don't even care about your things like I should. Lord, how much do I care about your church? about my family, about my own soul. Nehemiah went and surveyed the city at night and took stock. Oh, he breathed it in deep into his soul. The tears were not in vain. It was a real disaster. But brothers and sisters, he was moved by the Spirit of God. The Holy Spirit stirred him up. Hallelujah. It was God who sent his brother with the news. God who sent the news. And you know what God was doing? God was sitting on his throne, watching to see how his child will react. God is looking at us this morning to see how you and I react to the word of God. Have we really wept for our own sins before God? Some people say, oh, I drank. I did drugs. I prostituted myself, my body. We must mourn deeply and say, Lord, I've defiled myself in your name. Forgive me, Lord. We must mourn. We must mourn. But how many of us mourn also for the neglect of God's word in our lives? Has there ever been a deep mourning? Lord, I haven't read the word. I haven't even treasured it, Lord. No wonder I didn't make time for the word. And if I have read it, it was mechanical. Lord, I really haven't prayed with my whole heart with tears. And if I've done it, it's been very sporadic. Oh, my Father, help me to feel what Jesus feels about my soul. Could it be that I'm lukewarm? God is telling me, you need to strengthen the things that remain before it dies. God have mercy upon us. What is the state of our soul? How will we ever take action until we know the real state? But once we know 
as the Holy Spirit shows you and me, if that's the case, we must double up our efforts like no other point in our life and say, God, I'm going to rebuild the wall around my spiritual life, my soul, by praying more than ever, oh, my Father, I love you, I need you, I want you more than life. I want you, God. Hallelujah. More than popularity with my family, on my job, in my school, in my neighborhood. I want the acknowledgement and favor that comes from you. Oh, Jesus, I want to see you smile. That I'm a wise son and a wise daughter who has rearranged the priorities once and for all, never to go back. Building those walls Fortifying them through prayer, through the reading of the word, diligently, day and night. Day and night. That's the person that will be blessed. And by keeping the intruders out, the culprits that come to try to dilute God's message coming by the Holy Spirit, the laziness that creeps up in my flesh, the neglect of the love of God for other people. I want to watch that no more will my city of my soul be broken down, but it'll be fortified, impenetrable, impenetrable by the enemy. Hallelujah. Do you know, do you know that it's not just some idealized notion? That it's a nice, fantastic idea? It's a reality that God wants to give you and give me if you don't have it. That you are super strong in Jesus to do his will every day, busy with the Father's business. Not just a Sunday Christian, not just a spectator, but a person who will roll up the sleeves and get ready to work for God. To be on our knees and pray, that's the greatest work. Prayer is the greatest work, but how much time do we give to it? How much do you care for your son or daughter? How much time have you spent praying my name for your son or daughter? That'll show what kind of prayer life you have, what kind of concern you have for the welfare, the spiritual eternal welfare of your children. How much do you pray for your husband or wife? How much do you pray for yourself, for your spiritual life? What is the nature of your prayer? God wants us to pray for everything. God cares about your headache. Yes, he does. He loves you that much. He doesn't want us to suffer. He cares about your clothing. You're a son and daughter of the king. He doesn't want to go, wants you to go shabby. He'll provide. But far more important than those things is your heart, my heart. Am I in love with Jesus? Do I love him more than my physical life? Have I tasted and seen that the Lord is good? Have my eyes been focused on heaven, on things above? Or am I a worldling, a worldly carnal person? May God revive you if you're such a person. And if you have been revived, may you become stronger and stronger to do what the people did in Nehemiah 3, as we just read about seven verses, you see a catalog, a listing of man after man, scores of them, building section by section of the wall around Jerusalem, successful in 52 days, hallelujah. That which should have taken a long time because they not only had the problem, first of all, of no one understanding the gravity of the situation, that God is very displeased and he's upset because his city is in ruin and people's spiritual lives are in shambles. That's why they're not rebuilding. But they had, once they were stirred up by God, that I had to take action, they had the problem of enemies, the devil, the demon, coming in, taunting them, trying to weaken their hands, put fear in them. Sanballat and Tobiah, two of the leaders of that satanic move to stop the work of God. 
But you see, Nehemiah spoke by the power of God. He was fearless. Are you fearless? Am I fearless? Do we cave in easily? When we get some pains in our body, oh, I can't pray long? When the telephone rings, my family calls, oh, I got to tend to that first. When social media calls, I just have to eat now, I just have to cook now, I just have to do the laundry. What are the priorities? Do you know that God will set everything in order when we put him first? But if we do it the other way, seek those things and neglect God's kingdom first, we will go down fast. And we won't even know it. May God help us. You see, they were revived because they understood how terrible the situation. That's the first thing before you and I are moved to action. Otherwise, it'll be a, an emotional reaction. Oh, I got to pray. God, help me to pray. And we start a little bit and we stop. That's the end of that. But when we understand the gravity of our spiritual Lack, neglect, will be so aggressive and persevere until we become strong for the Lord. We will say every day, I don't need the pastor to remind me. I don't need anyone to remind me. The force of what God has spoken is, touch my heart, hallelujah. I know from here on, for the rest of my days on earth, I will pursue God with everything that's in me, because he deserves it. I need him desperately. My family needs him. And how can I ever represent God properly in front of my family? How will I have the boldness like Nehemiah had to confront whoever I need to confront unless I have a secret chamber, closet, prayer life that is vital before God? The God sees I'm praying day and night. That's my priority, my fellowship with God and my intercession. Jesus said this, if you pray in secret, your father who sees in secret will reward you openly. He will honor you. He will give force to your words when you speak to your family. They won't fall on deaf ears anymore. They will prick the conscience. The Holy Spirit will be behind it. Amen? Isn't that what we want? We want the Holy Ghost to be behind our words, behind our prayer, behind our mannerisms, our interaction. Oh, God, take over everything, every conversation, every word. May I never take it to myself that I will do my thing, but I want to be all about Jesus. Then the fire that's in you that's been revived will begin to revive the people around you, guaranteed, guaranteed, guaranteed. That's what we see in the Word of God. Time and time again. God stirred up Nehemiah. And the spirit that stirred him up worked through him to stir up the people. And they began to build, rebuild. You know what happened? They finished it in 52 days. Mere 52 days. You think God was pleased? God was very pleased. Because a spiritual revival had begun. When God's people rise up and say, Lord, I want to have self-discipline when it comes to the things of God. How many people have great discipline in their lives? They know when to get up for work. Many people go early. They go early. You know why? Some people are highly motivated by promotion. This earthly treasure. Highly motivated by reputation. I want people to think good of me. Their idol is people's praise. Their idol is money. The idol is promotion. Some people exercise religiously. You just have to drive on the FDR and see how many people religiously put on their running gear, all races, all ages, running religiously. You know why? For some, they really value their health. The idol is the physical health, this body, which is going to perish. It's not wrong to exercise, but The Bible says, bodily exercise profits little, but godliness profits unto all things. How much do we exercise ourselves to godliness? By praying, reading the word, diligent to say, oh, my father, what I read, I will do. Not as a hearer only, I will obey you, Lord. Build me up, Lord. Use me, Lord. 
change me so I can be used by you to change others. Some people, they're very studious. They're an idol of the grades. What school I go to, what career I can pursue. We must destroy the idols and have God as God on the throne of our hearts. Nehemiah was instrumental in the hands of Almighty God in a time of utter crisis. Nobody felt it except Nehemiah. Can God count on you and me that he can really reveal his heart about the depth, the gravity of the spiritual destruction and waste that is all around us and even within so we will rise up and say, Oh, Father, I mourn, I weep. Oh, not for show, not temporarily, but a deep yearning, my God, your kingdom come. Oh, your kingdom come. I live for your kingdom that it may come where you place me. As we close this morning, I want to quickly go to the book of Proverbs and the book of Isaiah. Proverbs. Chapter 25. The Lord gave this this morning for us. Proverbs 25 and 28. Can someone please read that? A man without self-control is like a city broken into and left without walls. The self-control rule over our own spirit. Guard your heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. How many of us still have a problem with controlling certain desires that are ungodly? Certain tempers? You see, if we don't have a strong inner man, strong spiritual life within will be just like Jerusalem, broken walls, under attack all the time. God doesn't want you to be under attack all the time. We must settle on that. Otherwise, it will be back and forth. I'm attacked, I'm set free. I'm attacked, I'm set free. We will be persecuted. In that sense, the devil will attack. We can get bodily affliction. But the attack must never be because I let my guard down. Amen? The attack must never be because the walls were broken down, because I have no self-control. I have no self-discipline when it comes to the things of God. My prayer life is in shambles. I'm under attack. I'm not honest with God. Perhaps that's the first thing we say over and over again. Brother, sister, church of God at ELBIN. Do you have integrity? Because if that's not there, You'll have no self-control. We have to have integrity. We must not lie. There should be not a hint of falsehood. We should not lie to God. We should not lie to the pastor. We should not lie to each other. We should not lie to ourselves. Lying should be out of our lives once and for all. And notice, lies are not just those that are spoken. Lies come by image, by actions and activities that I do because I want to present something to people. It's a falsehood. I should have integrity. And it's to say, Lord, make me a person that is honest, O oh God. Lord, a person that's honest through and through. I will not cheat on anything, period. I don't care how lucrative the offer. I don't care what's at stake. So help me, God. Falsehood is out of my life. I will not cut corners. I will do what God said to do the way he said to do it, period. I don't care about the mean faces of people that the devil will rile up to try to intimidate me. I'm a man, a woman, a principle. It's the word of God, and that's it. Hallelujah. What God commands is my life. You see, that self-discipline 
In the King James, it says the rule over one's own spirit is foundational to being, able, to being able to rebuild the walls. If I don't check my appetite, if I don't subdue the desires that are contrary to the will of God, if I don't recognize the gravity of that, how deadly it is to my spiritual life, if I'm not awake to that, I'll be like many, many so-called Christians today in many, many churches. They'll have instruments, they'll have worship, they'll have singers, worship leaders, lead pastors, associate pastors, they'll have a women's group, a men's group, youth, they'll have all kinds of activities, but a people that have broken walls. Because if you look into their lives, they are as worldly as the person who doesn't go to church. Their decision-making is not based upon the fear of Almighty God. What does God want me to do? No. What does the news say? What is the latest information about the schools in the area? About the housing? About the stores? Where can I consume my lusts upon? Rather than saying, Lord, what is your will? Oh, my Father, my Father, not one step will I take any longer. Not one decision for myself or my family without consulting you and waiting upon you until you speak. And Lord, if it goes 100% against what I feel, what I thought, what other people told me, the wisdom, the conventional wisdom of this world, of this age, of the devil, I will do only what you say. Brother, sister, know this. That's the heart that is truly guarded with the walls in place. Anything less than that is a broken down city with broken walls. God wants to strengthen you, make you a mighty man, mighty woman of God. Not always under attack because the walls are down, broken. But to say, no, I want to be a person like Nehemiah, like the men here in Nehemiah 3, who will begin the task, not give heed to any scare tactic from Satan, not be distracted with the cares of this life, but build my spiritual life with the word and prayer, the word and prayer, the word and prayer. Give a listening, obedient ear to spiritual counsel from my shepherds. What the Spirit of God speaks, that's my delight. That's my food, as Jesus said. My meat is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. God wants me to build my life and my family, spiritual life. He wants me to rise up and know my part in the church of God today. Lord, oh, my Father, if you said in the word of God, you've given gifts. What is the gift you give me, Lord? And what are the gifts that I need to earnestly desire? Oh, my Father, make me useful. Oh, I don't want to just cry without understanding the word. If God has given gifts, he wants to give me gifts. He wants to make me useful. I want to channel my prayers directed to those promises of God. But it all begins with an understanding of how desperately we need to mourn and weep before God and have a zeal that will not be quenched until we rise up and fulfill God's purpose for us on this earth, the reason he created us, to build the kingdom of God and to finish that work. The Bible says, make sure you fulfill your calling fulfill your ministry. Every one of us, not just the pastors, has a vital part in the kingdom of God. How many of us know what it is? How many of us care to know? We need to be on our faces in our prayer closet, seeking God, and he will show it to you. What a joy, what a thrill, more than anything else in life, to be in the perfect will of God, doing what God wants me to do, when he wants me to do it, in the way he wants me to do it, and to finish his work. Very quickly, let's go to Isaiah 58. We conclude with this promise, wonderful promise from God. He says, some of you, Isaiah 58, right to the end of the chapter, verse 12 reads this way. Perhaps somebody else can read it. Perhaps a sister. Isaiah 58, verse 12. Please read that. 
Those from among you shall build the old waste places. You shall raise up the foundations of many generations, and you shall be called the repairer of the breach, the restorer of streets to dwell in. Now, praise God. In the New Living Translation, it says, some of you will rebuild the deserted ruins of your cities. Then you will be known as a rebuilder of walls and a restorer of homes. God wants to use us in this very thing, to build up the kingdom of God. As I said, the church at large, at large, is in chaos in these last days. We're truly in the Laodicean age. You just look at the lives of the people, how they are thrilled to be praised by men, thrilled to have material things. They think they have it all. Thrilled because they're gathering together in large numbers, perhaps, in movements, but no self-control, no self-discipline, no total surrender to God, no discernment as to the actual spiritual state. Therefore, no drive, no motivation to rise up and do the things God has called them to do, to rebuild. God wants us to be among those who will rebuild the deserted ruins spiritually and be a rebuilder of walls and restorer of homes. Notice in verse 11, God says, the Lord will guide you continually. Do you want this? God will guide you continually. He said he'll do it, giving you water when you are dry and restoring your strength. You will be like a well-watered garden, like an ever-flowing spring. The Holy Spirit will enable us to get back to God the way we should and to pursue him so that his purpose for our lives will be accomplished in a grand manner. Blessed be God's name, shall we pray. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Praise your holy name, Lord. Oh, God, I thank you. Abba, Father, thank you, Lord, that you've taught us. Keep our heart, Lord. Have self-discipline to rule over our spirits so that everything, every appetite, every faculty of our body, of our minds will be yielded to the Holy Spirit. It will be used by God in a mighty way, every one of us, to seek you diligently with all our heart, day and night, to really mourn and weep and fast with a purpose. God will take my tears and he'll use my life to make an eternal difference in the lives of my family and the church of God and the world I live in. Oh, Father, I pray, remind everyone of the various things you've spoken throughout this day and the coming days, that they will do all that you said to have a truly blessed life, full of the Holy Spirit, like an ever-flowing spring giving life to others. I pray this for every brother and sister. In Jesus' mighty name, amen.